You go to bed on Christmas Eve, and for some reason or the other, you don't wake up till the day after Christmas. You don't wake up to share in the festivities of family and friends. You don't wake up to open your presents. You don't wake up to enjoy just the wonder and the joy. And when you wake up, you realize that the day is December the 26th, and you have missed Christmas. You are wondering why you missed Christmas, but the reality of it is you've slept through Christmas and you've missed it completely. That would be an absolutely horrible thought. The thought of sleeping through Christmas, sleeping through the wonder and the joy and the excitement that all of us know at Christmas time. But there was something far worse than that that happened better than 2,000 years ago. An entire town missed God at Christmas time. Let me invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 2. And I want to read the first seven verses. And the Bible says these words. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went out from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was, while they were there, the days were accomplished, that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Imagine the thought of being in the town of Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, and here's a couple that comes into town. They have to come to Bethlehem because that's where they're to be registered according to their ancestral background, according to their ancestry. They have to come to Bethlehem, and really and truly, when you start reading through the Gospel of Luke, you realize that God had His hand on them because the Bible prophesied about 800 years beforehand that there was going to come a governor and he was going to be born in Bethlehem. But Mary and Joseph didn't live in Bethlehem. So how are they going to go back to Bethlehem? How are they, how is God going to get them there? Well, simple. The Bible says that the governor declared a, a taxation and everybody, God orchestrated in the king's mind, in the governor's mind, that everybody had to go back to their ancestral home and that's when the prophecy of Micah chapter 5 verse 2 was fulfilled. But the sad reality about it was, when you look in Bethlehem, the Bible never records Jesus ever going back to Bethlehem. There is no record in biblical text that Jesus ever returned to that place of Bethlehem again. And here is that ancestral town, the town of David, the town in which there's so much said from Genesis all the way uh, through the gospel records. And yet they missed it. Imagine a town in which... It wasn't a large town, it wasn't a massive town, but that town missed out on the prophecy of Micah. That town missed out on the very sobering reality of what we're celebrating in this day and time and the celebration of Christ. They missed God at Christmas. You know, the reality of it is in the world that you and I are living in, so many people are missing God at Christmas, and I'm not talking about unbelievers. I'm not talking about lost people because... It's expected for the lost person to miss God. It's expected for them to miss God at Christmas. But the Bible records that they missed it in Bethlehem. In every single situation, with the exception of two, everybody was doing their own thing. They was living their life. And they missed the greatest gift that ever came into the world, the greatest prophecy fulfillment that has come in the birth of Jesus Christ. You know, the reality about it is, though, if that small town of Bethlehem, if those citizens can miss Christmas, the reality is that every one of us can miss Christmas. 
And I'll tell you, it's not very hard in this day and time to miss God at Christmas time. All you have to do is show up at a certain location on Black Friday and get trampled on, and it's easy to miss God at Christmas time. Because our world is a world of commercialism. Our world is a world of buying and selling and getting and having and achieving. And and yet the reality of it is, all of that is to no avail if there is no Christ at Christmas time. Amen? If there is no birth of the Messiah. So follow along with me if you would in your outline. Because here's some sobering realities about the folks in that day and time, which is a contrast and a comparison to our day and time. You know, the Bible makes it pretty clear that uh, they were not listening. You know, there's a really a sharp contrast between what happened in Bethlehem and, and uh, what happened 40 days later. You remember that there was a period of time that went by, and the Bible says that they took Jesus up to the temple. And after they took Jesus up to the temple, there was a a man that met this prophetic child. Now, I don't know about you, I've said a lot of things when I've held a little bitty one. You know, you can say they're absolutely adorable, they're cute, they are absolutely lovely, they're the spitting image of their mom or dad or both. But I've never said what Simeon said. Imagine the thought, here is Simeon, and he is given the Christ, and the Bible says that he says these words, Lord, and I can now depart in peace. In other words, I am ready to die because I have seen, I've experienced the fulfillment of the Messiah that is to come. You know, the Bible records his words. The Bible says in, uh, in Luke chapter 2, verse 25, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him. You know, here is one man who knew he had been promised by God that he wasn't going to die until he saw the Messiah. Now, I don't know about you, but that would absolutely be exciting. Can you imagine if the Lord came to you and said, you're not going to die until you see the Lord Jesus Christ coming on the clouds in the rapture? That would get exciting. That would let you know it's about time for it to be fulfilled. The Bible says back in Micah chapter 5 that there is a prophecy given. And Micah says, Bethlehem, you're one of the smallest towns, but out of you is going to come a governor that's going to govern the people. In other words, he's going to have an eternal kingdom. He is going to be the king of kings and the lord of lords. But here's the sobering reality. They missed it. And the shocking reality is, there was really no sorrow on their part. They weren't really that saddened. They probably weren't even thinking because they expected a Messiah to come. Now don't misunderstand, they were not ignorant of the law of the Old Testament. They expected a Messiah to come, but they didn't expect a Messiah to come the way the Messiah came. They expected Him to come in force and fury and power and, in essence, on a stallion to be a conqueror. They didn't expect Him to come and to take the sin debt of the world. They didn't understand uh, so many different factors of it. And the reality is, they missed it. Here is the Messiah born in their town. Here is the Christ child born right under their noses, so to speak, and you don't find the the town going to the Messiah. You don't find them going to pay homage to Him. You don't find them trying to find Joseph and Mary. You don't find that. Everybody was, was busy. You know, they didn't listen to the Word of God. Now, listen to me very carefully. The Bible says in Micah 5, 2, listen to the prophecy. But thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Micah said under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, under God's direction, this is what I'm going to do. You see, the reality of it is, is this is not only a, a book of salvation, this is a book of unfolding prophetic events, folks. Amen? This is a book that tells you and me the history of the world. This is a book that reminds us that the history of the world is in God's hands. You know, God announced through His prophet, Bethlehem was going to have a special guest. 
It wasn't just going to be any child. It wasn't just going to be a wonderful king someday. Going to be the God-man. Going to be the God-man who would come and who would be born of a virgin. And yet, they weren't listening. They weren't listening. They weren't listening to the Word of God. And here's the reality. Now, I say this to, to you and me because we're supposedly Bible people. It amazes me how many Christians miss it. You know, miss the entire meaning of Christmas. Folks, it really don't matter how big a present you buy. That's not the issue at Christmas time. Amen? It's not how much you have under the tree. It's not how, how massive they are, what the size of them are. What have you done? How much have you recognized Jesus in this season that's to honor Him? All those in Bethlehem were doing their thing. They were living their life. They were, they were doing the normal routine of life. And they missed it. They, they missed it because they didn't listen to the Word of God. They didn't listen to the prophecies. Some of them would have said, well, you know, Mike is just a man and he don't know what he's talking about and, and I just don't know if I believe what he says. Isn't it interesting? That's what people say today all over about the Word of God. And uh, God just simply says this, I'll be exalted among the heathen. That's the case, case closed. God said, I'm going to be exalted. Everyone is going to know that I am the Lord God. You know, they weren't listening to the Word of God. They weren't listening to the prophecies of God. And they weren't listening to the Spirit of God. Now, I want you to listen to me very carefully. I want you to listen to me very carefully. I want you to listen to me very carefully. The softer I speak, some of you have raised up to listen. Do you know that the Bible says God doesn't speak through thundering clouds? Necessarily. The Bible says he speaks through a what? Still, small voice. Now let me ask you a question. When was the last time you got alone with the Father? You just got alone with his word? You got alone and opening his word and you said, Father, I'm here, speak to me. I'm your servant, speak to me. Like that young prophet, Samuel who said, speak, Lord, your servant's listening. We have such an arrogant view of God speaking today. I want you to listen to me very carefully. Don't turn me off yet. Here's what we say. Well, now, if God wants to tell me something, He'll tell me something. He's God. No. You know what He does? He uses very soft means at first. Someone says that God whispers through the pleasures of life. And... Someone says that God is screaming to us through the pains of life. Now think about it for a moment. Here is Simeon. Here is Anna. Here are two individuals. They were listening to God. They were listening to God's Spirit, and they were waiting for the consolation. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in Luke chapter 2, verse 36, there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanel, the tribe of Asher. She was of great age. Now, I don't know how old she was, but it says she was great age. Luke said that, not me, under the inspiration. And he had lived with a, and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow, about four score and four years, 84 years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake unto him and all them that looked for the redemption of Jerusalem. Listen. Here was a woman, she knew, Simeon knew that this is the consolation, this is God's Son in the flesh. Now listen to me very carefully. Whether you eternally end up in heaven or whether you eternally end up in hell is your choice. But listen to me very carefully. God will have spoken to you through the pages of Scripture. If you listen, you will enjoy the eternal pleasures of God in heaven. If you ignore, you're going to miss out. Just like so many in Bethlehem missed out. They didn't listen to God. They didn't listen to His Word. They didn't listen to the Spirit. And, and probably they thought, well, you know, like so many people will think today, well, I'm good enough and God's going to take me to heaven. Listen, they miss God. Let me ask you a question. Are you missing all the wonder and the joy and the exciting things that God would love to do in your life, but you just won't listen to Him? 
You say, well, if God wants to speak to me, he'll speak to you. No, listen to me real carefully. I want you to listen to me very carefully. And if you don't believe it, turn to Matthew 13, 58. I won't go back and read it. But the Bible says Jesus is walking through a town. Capernaum is the name of it. And the Bible says he couldn't do much. He couldn't do many mighty works. You say, well, what's wrong with Jesus? Why can't Jesus do much? Because they wouldn't listen to him. Do you realize if you don't listen to God, you can miss Him completely and the joy and the wonder and the excitement He wants to bring in your life? Listen, I tell you what. Now, I say this and you say, well, you're saying that because you're the preacher. Yes, I'm saying it, but here's the reality. I'm standing right here and you know I'm not telling you a lie. As a matter of fact, you don't tell lies. But here's the reality. I love preaching and teaching the Word of God because, think about it a moment. Preaching about somebody who loves you unconditionally, who has only his best for you unconditionally, who's not going to give you what you deserve. Listen, wouldn't you like to have what you deserve? Some people will say, well, you know what? I want, I want what's coming to me. No, you do not. Every one of us, what's coming to us would be eternal doom, eternal damnation, eternal retribution. And God says, you know what I want to give you? I want to give you something you don't deserve. I want to give you grace. I want to give you a gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. But all those in Bethlehem missed it. What about you? Are you like those you're missing it because you're not listening to God? You're not listening to God speak through His Word? You you have your life sort of panned out. I was sharing in the Sunday school class that last night I just happened to turn on uh, uh, YouTube and... Watch one of my all-time favorite stars that I loved watching when I was a kid. His name was Pistol Pete Maravich. And I was watching him. He was on the 700 Club. And here's what he was saying. He said, you know, I had it all. He said, I was the first million dollar, one of the first million dollar players that was contracted to play with the team. He said, I was the only white player that was ever asked by the Harlem Globetrotters to play with them. And uh, someone said that they did a calculation of his, of his playing, that if they had the three-point shot now, that his average per game would be 57 points. He was that fantastic of a shooter. But in the testimony that he was sharing, he said, you know, I've had it all. I've had Mercedes. I've had BMWs. I carry three to $5,000 in my pocket. And he said, it's nothing. He said, it leaves a void. He said, it's left a void in my heart. And uh, no wonder he's one of the greatest players. He practiced six to eight hours a day by his own terms. He said, I'd go to bed and I'd have a basketball in my hand. I'd be throwing it up. And he said, thunderstorm would come and I'd go out the window and play ball. But here's what he said. He said, all of that was nothing. He said, it brought nothing. It brought no lasting fulfillment. And here's the reality. The day after Christmas, many people are going to take down their Christmas tree. They're going to put up their presents. They're going to return them. Don't go to some places day after Christmas. Because you'll be... And watch the Christmas spirit go right out the window. But listen, they missed the Messiah at Christmas. They missed Jesus coming into their presence. Let me ask you a question. Are you missing Jesus in your life? You say, well, I'm saved. Yes, but you can still miss out on Him. You say, Jesus won't make you serve Him. He won't make you love Him. He won't make you follow Him. You say, I've never heard that. He's God. He'll make you do whatever He wants to. No, He can't. You say, yes, He can. No, He can't. God cannot violate His holy nature. And His holy nature, He gives you choice. The greatest act of love is to give you and me free choice. And He will never violate His, his holy, loving nature. And you see, the reality of, was they weren't listening. They weren't listening to God. They weren't listening to the Spirit of God. And the reality was they were so preoccupied with lesser things. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. Suppose tomorrow is the day you leave this world and you march out to be with the Lord. And tomorrow is your entrance into eternity to your destination. And suppose you're seen your entire earthly life and He shows you how much you missed out on because you decided this was important, that was important. That was important. That was important. One of the things that Pistol Pete shared in his testimony, he said this. He said, you know, one of my friends, co-players at a certain age, he said, he gave his life to Christ. But he said, I didn't want it then. He said, I wanted to go to the college. I wanted to go to the NBA. And he talks about how much he missed out on. But here's the reality. They were, they were preoccupied. What were they preoccupied? Everything under the sun. 
You know, here's the reality. We can be preoccupied with everything. Listen to us talk. Well, you know what? I got to do this and I got to do that and I got to do the other. And we become so preoccupied that we believe it ourselves. You know, some people feel like they're so preoccupied they don't even have time to die. You know, you have to work that into your schedule. But you won't be too busy to die. Someone said there's two things you're going to take time for, and one of those is death. The other, and I guess it may have been a government worker, said there's going to be taxes. But here's the reality. They were preoccupied with the requirements of their government. Now, listen very carefully. It's so similar to our day and time, it's, it's intriguing. The government was telling people what they needed to do. Does that sound like today? The government was saying, you've got to do this. Well, buddy, that don't happen in America, does it? The government was saying, you've got to go back to your hometown. You've got to go back to your ancestral town. And they were preoccupied because they would have got in trouble. You know, I don't know what their IRS system was like, but I guarantee you, some of the people, there was a lot of inconvenience, but they didn't want to get in trouble with with the authorities and the government in that day and time. You know, but here's the reality. I want you to get this. Don't you think God orchestrated in the mind of... Of the, of the leader. You know, the Bible says that, uh, you know, Caesar Augustus. Don't you think God ordered the decree to be made out of his mind? Why? Because God said it's time. Now, I want you to listen to me real carefully. Was Jesus Christ literally born? Amen? Man, that's a weak amen. Was Jesus Christ literally born? Amen? He lived 33 years, and you can even find out the timetable which he was born because he was born under the timetable of Caesar Augustus, and he reigned from about 7 B.C. to about uh, uh, 3 A.D. in his first reigning, and you can find that by historical records. But here's the reality. The Bible says that God said it's time. Now, I want you to get this in your mind. Do you realize that in that prophecy of Christ coming to the earth, God in heaven said, it's now time. In other words, God gave His Son into the earth. And so what that means is this. There is a timing in the economy of God when God says, it's now time. I tell you what I get excited about. There's going to be a time for the rapture. Because the Bible says it's going to happen. John 14 says it. Corinthians says it. Thessalonians says it. There's going to be a time for the rapture just as there was a time for Jesus Christ to come. And we're going to be gone. But you know, they were preoccupied. What is it that's been so busy with you this Christmas season? You've completely forgotten God. Let me ask you a question. I want to ask this of every single born-again believer in this sanctuary. Now, if you're an unbeliever, I'm not going to ask you this question. I'm only asking this of Christians. How many of you have at least taken your Bible out and read the Christmas story already? I'm not saying in church. You say, well, we do it in church. I'm not talking about when you come to church, when you're half tired, when you're worn out. When was the last time you opened the Bible and read the Christmas story? When was the last time you did it? When was the last time you picked the Bible up and said, Lord, what are you saying to me? And you see the reality of it is, we can become so preoccupied, we can become so busy, we can become so busy with stuff. It's our stuff, it's important. But you know what? It's not really that important. How important is it? Think about this a minute. The day you leave this world, the sun don't stop shining. Society barely knows about us leaving this world, don't they? Somebody reads the obituary. Now, you know, the Bible says they were, they were preoccupied. They were preoccupied with the demands of life. You know, they had their own set of problems. Now, they didn't worry about technological issues, and there were not superstores in their day. And, uh, but, you know, they had their own problems, their own situations. You know, innkeeper, you know, we, we don't really know who the innkeeper was, don't have a name. The Bible just gives him an innkeeper. I have a hunch if, uh, if if his name was given, was given, nobody would name their child that. Just like, uh, I don't think I've ever met anybody that's got a son or by the name of Judas. I don't think I know anybody that's named their kids Judas. Uh, or you don't uh, see anybody by the name of Jezebel. Well, I do know one named Jezebel, my next door neighbor. I go by his house and he's got a dog lot. And on top of that little dog lot, he's got the name Jezebel. His dog's named Jezebel. 
But I don't think many people would want to name their, their, their uh, child uh, Judas or Jezebel. Or if this innkeeper had a name, probably you wouldn't want to. And, and the reality was he was busy making a living and he missed it. Think about it. Here is the Messiah. You are the closest one. You are the one that you are, are confronted with the Messiah. You're confronted with a mother who is going to give birth to the Messiah, to Christ the King. And listen to his prophetic words, and it's words that ripple down through history. There was no room for them in the end. Isn't that simply the reality of the world, of, of our lives? But think about it for a moment. What about your own faithfulness to God? You know, the Bible says it's required of a man to be found what? To be found busy. Is that what it says in the Bible? It's required of a man to be found successful. It's required of a man to be found in church 24 hours a day. No. It's required of a man to be found what? You tell me. Faithful. Now I want to ask you, child of God, are you so busy? You have busied yourself out of being faithful to God. You really can't enjoy Christmas because when you just say the name Christ, it just aggravates your spirit. And here's why. One of the reasons it's aggravating is because it shows us our sin. You see, now, if Jesus Christ was here in the flesh today, many wouldn't have time to give him a meal. You say, yes, I would. I'd invite him to my house. Many wouldn't have time to even be kind to him. Many wouldn't even have time to say hello. You say, well, I I certainly would. No. No. No, you wouldn't. You say, how do you know? Because he says so. For as much as you've done it unto the least of these, when you've done it to a little boy, to a little girl, when you've done it to a a three-year-old, to a little five-year-old, what does Jesus say? You've done it like unto me? Mm Mm-mm. You've done it unto me. The Lord showed me something this morning, a fresh and a new. One of the little fellows was coming through, and he just looked up at one of our men. Probably that little boy, he was 10 feet tall. I mean, and all, a lot of times little kids can see is their kneecaps. You ever stop thinking about it? I want to ask you something. If Jesus says, if you do it unto the least of these, you're doing it unto me. Why are you not getting on your knees and talking to little kids? Why are you not getting down like this and say, Honey, how you doing? How's your day been? How's your week been? My name's Joe. My name's Carl. My name's Josh. What's your name? Let me ask you this. Do you remember when you was a kid and adults didn't have time for you? And you remember the ones who did. But see, in in Bethlehem, they didn't have time. And here here is the innkeeper. He didn't have time. We replicate that. Listen, we say all sorts of things about the innkeeper. Shame on him. Shame, shame, shame on him. But we do the same thing. We don't have time to read the Bible. We don't have time to be in His Word. We don't have time. We don't have time because, you know, we've got other things to do. We've got a busy schedule. I can't be found being in the Word of God. I've I've got a busy schedule. I can't be found studying the Word of God, learning more of the Word of God. I can't be found doing that. I mean, you just don't know my schedule. Think about the breaths you breathe. Every one is a gift from Holy God. Amen? And you see, not only were they preoccupied with the demands of life and preoccupied with their government, But here's the reality. They had some terribly distorted expectations. You know, Bethlehem is a Jewish town. And here's the thing about it. They they thought 
Messiah was coming. Now, don't misunderstand me. They didn't think that there wasn't a Messiah that was coming. They believed that Messiah would come. As a matter of fact, uh, some women Jesus talked to, they said, you know, when the Messiah comes, He'll show us all things. In other words, they knew that a Messiah was coming. And Jesus said, I that speak to you am He. But here's the reality. They, they, They had some distorted perspectives. You see, we, we, really, we really have some distorted perspectives in and of ourselves. We, you know, we think uh, God moves in certain ways, but here's what God says. You know, if you do it to the least of these, you do it to me. In other words, I'm watching how you treat. I'm watching how you treat that person who can't give you a single thing. I'm watching that person, that little boy, that little girl. I'm watching how you treat them. And I'm, I'm, I'm just watching. I'm watching how you respond. And you know... They they just didn't match up with their expectations. The innkeeper, I'm sure if he would have, quote, known, here's the Messiah, here's the Lamb of God, uh, he would have got out of there, but here's the reality. You know what God does? He entertains you sometimes in ways you don't know it. Some of you in your life have entertained a stranger that you didn't know. You've entertained that stranger, and God has said it in His Word. Be careful when you entertain strangers, for in so doing, some have entertained angels unaware. What that tells me is this. An angel looks just like a human being. God gives him the ability to act just like a human being, talk like a human being, talk English if he needs to talk English, talk uh, Chinese, talk to look like any human being right around. You wouldn't know him or her from your next door neighbor. And here's what God does. He says, I want to watch. But you see, here's the reality. This innkeeper, preoccupied, preoccupied with his end, preoccupied with his stuff, preoccupied with his life. You know, they had distortions. They had distorted views. They had a distorted look. And here's the reality. They expected Jesus to come another way. They expected their Messiah to come in power and in force and in might. You know, the Bible says He is going to come. The Bible makes it very clear that there's going to come a time that He is going to come. The Bible says that we're going to meet the Lord in the air, according to those of us that are saved to the church. You know, they miss God because it wasn't spectacular enough for them. Now, I want you to listen to me real carefully. Are you watching? Are you watching? I hope you're still watching. How exciting does this look? Now listen to me real carefully. I did that for a deliberate reason. You know what we are a world of? We're a world who wants entertainment. We want the spectacular. We want the amazing. We want the fantastic all the time. We're waiting for the next circus to come through town. But you know what David the king did much of? Exactly what you saw me just doing. Do you know what Isaiah did much of? What you just saw me doing. Do you know what Moses did much of? What you saw me doing. Meditating and thinking. There was a time when I was a boy. I can remember him doing it. My grandfather on my mother's side. Now I can't really do it right because I don't have bibs on. But I can remember him being outside. I'll do part of it. I can't do it just But he would have his hands in his back pockets. And he'd just be outside looking around. And I thought, Grandpa, you okay? What'd you lose? The Bible says to what? Be still and know. When was the last time you were still alone with God and you said, Father, in the stillness of this moment, in the stillness of this time, I want to just sit before you and know afresh you're my God. 
We're just like Bethlehem. Now, we have technology, we have vehicles. They were busy walking, going about, but they missed it. They completely missed it. Here is Bethlehem, given the greatest guest the history has ever known. And not a single one in that town recognized it. Save Simeon and Anna when they took him up to the temple. They knew that this was the Messiah. They knew this was the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. If that city missed it, it reverberates throughout the centuries that millions have missed it. Millions and millions and millions and millions. You see, the reality of it is, it's bad enough if you went to sleep on the 24th, slept all that, Christmas Day and woke up on the 26th. That's not the worst thing in the world. It'd be horrible to miss Christmas. But there's going to be a day and a time, friend. And I'm trying to be as straightforward and honest with you as I can. There's going to be a day and time that you're going to breathe your last breath, walk out of this life. And if you miss heaven, you missed it all. If you miss the gift of God in Jesus Christ, there's no coming back. There's no waking up again next year and doing it over. There's no second chance. There's no, let me try to do that again. Give me one more chance. Give me another shot. There's nobody in hell saying, God, let me run through it again. They know that they know that they know that they know it's over. And their eternity is set and sealed and final because they've said, I've chosen to miss God. I deliberately, willfully, intentionally, purposely choose to miss because I want the pleasures of sin for a season. Now, I want to say this in closing. God won't make you not miss Him. But I'll tell you, there's something special just sitting down, just reading out loud the Christmas story. Because if it wasn't for Christ, you have no hope and neither do I. I don't know where you are spiritually, but here's what I do know. He came to save you and me from our sins. If you don't place your faith in Him, then all of your sins are still on your head, are still on you, and somebody's going to pay for your sins. You can bank on that. And so if you don't let Jesus Christ pay for your sins, then you walk out of eternity and you have basically said, I don't want Jesus to pay for my sins. I'm going to pay for them. And you'll pay for them for all of eternity in a place called hell. That's simply the truth of the Word of God. Jesus said, many, speaking to a crowd, He said, many of you will die in your sins. Some of you under the sound of my voice you're going to die in your sin. Some of you are going to die and probably go to hell because you'll just say, you know what? I'm going to take my chances. That's what many have said through the centuries. And would to God they could, that if they came back to this world, you wouldn't believe them because God's given us His Word and He tells us the truth. And you decide what you do with that truth. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your truth. And Father, I pray for that person or persons who needs to come. Father, I pray that you would just overshadow and be with them and lead them and guide them. And Lord, draw them by your hand and your power. Father, we thank you. Thank you for this day and this time. Father, I pray for that person who's under conviction, who needs to place their faith in Jesus Christ. And you say, I'm I'm coming. I want to be saved. Father, I pray for them right now. Draw them to yourself in Christ's name. Amen.